ES Audio. This is a bonus episode taken from our business show, How to Be a CEO, with David Marsland speaking to British entrepreneur Trini Woodall. When you're going into business, it's always good to bring someone along with you. Just one person would help. But 2.1 million, that's like taking a tribe. The most amazing, outspoken, fantastic women. And also they're really like your staunchest champions and they're your harshest critics. So when we do something and they might think, oh, we don't like that. We really think, okay, this is the feedback from the community. So what does that mean for us for product development? We really listen to what they're saying. The Trini tribe's been a huge part of Trini Woodall's success, building a makeup empire. But she didn't start with that number in 2017. In fact, the number some potential investors were more interested in was this one, 51. That's how old she was when the company launched. I did have one or two people who would say occasional comments like, how many years do you think you've got left to run the business? Which I (laughs) I look back now and I think, are you fucking kidding? I mean, are you kidding? I'm David Marsden from The Evening Standard. Trini's story, like so many other founders, features a lot of barriers. Age, gender, and in this particular one, fashion trends. It had been a while since she was on TV with what not to wear. Fashion's influencer spotlight was looking elsewhere. Determination, then, is a huge factor in anyone's journey to become CEO. And it's something Trini has had for a very long time. It's not the first time I've done it. You know, I started doing my own businesses in parentheses from when I was about 16. So I always had the bug of being an entrepreneur. And the first business I did was a hair bow business. And on my Saturdays, I would go to the market and buy these little jewels. And then I got some people with a partner I did this with in Brixton to make these bows. And we just walked the streets and sold them. We sold them to a few stores, including sort of Harvey Nichols and things. And I did a Saturday job at partridges cutting meat as well. So I used the money from the Saturday job cutting the meats on the deli area. And that went into buying the stock first thing in the morning because I started that job at like 10 a.m. and used to go to the markets at sort of 6 a.m. to, you know, 9 a.m. to get the good stuff at the right price. And I loved it. And then when I left school, the girl I did it with wanted to go to art school and I didn't want to go to university. So I thought I'll just keep this going. And I didn't have the strength at the time to think I could do it by myself. I liked the fact that even though I've always generally been the more organised in these partnerships I've had over my years, I like the momentum of not doing something by myself. It's a very different mindset. So I then did, a few years later, a company called Socket To You. It sold socks. I got girls to sell them in trading floors. I went to Barter, this Eastern European sock company, and made a deal with them. They were not that well made, the socks. There was a bit of backlash in terms of men's socks falling down. But we had about six months of a phenomenal sock run. In between that, actually, I had a shirt pressing business that I also did. And I got girls who also wanted to earn money in sixth form. And we we charged a pound per shirt. And then working with Susanna was, in a way, a Mm self-employment experience. But it wasn't starting a business. There's a fundamental difference between having a contract where you're a self-employed person, and then wondering if that next August, that contract will be renewed. So being ready to start this, I I think I looked at all my failures, my my dot-com bust in in 99, 2000, which I learned a tremendous amount from. And what I learned from those of, you know, that that first experience, I overhired too quickly. I got, I'm going to say I got funded too quickly, because that really has an effect if you are well-funded too quickly without having to be a scrappy startup, you don't learn as much. You just don't, because first of all, you hire in experts earlier on. You don't have to learn it yourself because you think, I can hire an expert. And so this time, it wasn't the best time to do it. It was the worst time. And, you know, I hadn't got any future revenue. All my sort of contracts had sort of dried up. My royalties had dried up. And I had to get out of the lifestyle I had because I couldn't afford it. But it was also the time I was 50. And I remember a friend of mine had said to me, when you reach 50, you won't care so much what people think. It will be very freeing. And my 50th year was actually a challenging one because I had some personal challenges. But when I reached 51, I had that feeling. I thought, it's now or never and I'm going to do it. It was just like, it was a given. It was so clear to me. Very long-winded answer. No, but what, what I was going to say was there's an awful lot I want to unpack from that. But let's okay. start the most yeah. recent one, which was that you were 50, 51 when you started this business. Was age a barrier? 
at all for you? The only time I define myself by age is when I'm looking at the different emotional mindsets of our customer. And I'm looking at sometimes with a predominantly younger team, and they're incredibly good at understanding attitudes of people irrelevant of age. But there are certain moments when we think, what age model should we have that represents what we're doing and we want to have from 18 to 83? I know as a woman in my 50s what I feel for an, a segment of our audience, but I think our team are really great and they, whatever their age, they, they know how people feel who we want to get in touch with and, and tell about the brand. So it was only more of an issue with investors, actually. And I came across some age bias when I was seeking investment of people feeling, first of all, the the category that I was going after of this plus 35 woman was um, not a great category. And and what I was doing in tech with personalization was much better for a millennial or a Gen Z. So, you know, why didn't I shift my whole proposition to go after 20-year-olds? I did have one or two people who... Um, just would say occasional comments like, how many years do you think you've got left to run the business? Which I I look back now and I think, are you fucking kidding? I mean, are you kidding? But like, it's there. And, you know, the joke in my team is, is I have more energy than than my team. It's like there's 200 people in the team, but they always comment on this thing. And I just think it's so ironic that there's some investors saying, but do you think you'll have the energy? And I'm like, Oh, God. (laughs) Really? But anyway, that's, you know, I can look back now in the position I'm in and and laugh. But at the time, I just thought, please, may I never be in a position of being biased around people's ages. There's so much bias anyway. It's one of the biases we should so easily overcome. Let's go to a quick ad break. Why not follow the Leader Podcast so you never miss a new episode? But why didn't you then? given it would, might have been a bit easier for you to do what those financiers were suggesting and go for the 20-year-old market. Why stick to your guns? Why go, no, it's, it's 35 plus, and that's what I'm doing? Because I knew that was the gap in the market. And I always felt I wanted to go after this audience where it would ultimately, the judgment would be about retention. And now we are in a market where the judgment on DTC brands, which there will be a lot of people who will not make it through the next couple of two business cycles, It's about your retention. What it meant for us is when we launched, the benchmarks that investors wanted to see of that kind of hockey growth didn't happen in year one and in year two because we were just growing very slowly. We had these cohorts were incredibly loyal, but we just, you know, weren't like getting, you know, 500 new customers a day at that stage. That probably was a very big challenge too of people saying, you know, these people won't go online. And I was thinking, but I'm making something from my experience of all these women I've met around the world who just say how confused they are at the makeup counter, I can actually solve a lot of their problems by persuading them to come online and get matched personally. And that took lots of convincing because that association with a gamification around beauty is so associated with a younger audience and only post-COVID is it associated with that virtual try-on which a lot of traditional beauty brands had to you know, catch up with when we went into lockdown for on and off for two years because they had no revenue through retail. So they had to kind of get their customer to try things on online. And it was a far broader market that was understanding the importance of technology to sell makeup. You did a lot of work on social media, a lot of work on Instagram, talking directly to potential customers. When you build a business plan, I mean, for anyone who's listening, who's, you know, starting a business, you always think, how do you build out that three to five year plan when you have no revenue yet? What do you base it upon? It's one of the biggest challenges because you overarch and people will just won't believe you and you undersell and people won't invest. And it's like you want to give appetite, but you want to have a basis. So I really felt the only true basis I could do is say I have 110,000 followers which is what I had then. So I'm going to say 3% of them will buy. And then I'm going to say how many more followers I'll get per month. And I'm going to grow it initially on that social media following because nobody knew the brand Trini London. A few people knew me, bias or none. You know, they they knew that there was a name awareness. So that is what happened to give us those numbers of where we thought we'd get to. And actually, we hit, you know, for the first three years, we hit exactly what we said we would hit, literally to the letter. So one of the investment companies who invested with us when they were leaving their company, they said, you're the only person I invest in 
who actually said exactly this is what it be, and it was not not that's a good or a bad thing, but it was just like that's that it was a real reality benchmark. And at the beginning of our brand, having that social media presence, albeit small compared to the numbers that we see today, it gave an intimacy. And, you know, when you're talking about beauty, it's a very intimate thing. And you want to be able to have conversations with women that are really personalized and make them connect emotionally. So that helped us a lot to have a point of difference that was different. And at the same time in 2017, when we launched, somebody started a Trini tribe on Facebook that we only discovered in 2018. By the time there were two or three communities around England who had started these sort of fan pages and they'd taken like a little bit of our logo or a picture of me and they were all different and they were all like started by people who just like liked what the conversation was, whether it was conversation that was coming directly from me or from me and then Trini Lander when it launched. So we got in touch and we said, look, you, you're calling yourself the Trini Tribe. Do you want us to make you a little logo? You know, they were all like would have one person who'd be an admin to this community page and... So now we have 33 tribes in 16 countries around the world. They will be inspired by stuff that's been on Trini London or Trini Woodall, and they will post. And you get many, many people who never post a picture of themselves. You know, the first comment is, it's the first time I've taken a picture of myself in 20 years. And you get these essays, and then you get 100 comments of support. I would say maybe, I don't know, between 60 and 70% are our customer. But some of them might never be our customer because they'd like, we're beyond their price range. But it doesn't stop them following and it doesn't stop the growth of that community. And the most important thing with a community when you're a brand, having a community, it should be autonomous to the brand. Like we localized warehousing to Australia. We had 10% of our customer or 15% of our customer in Australia. And we decided to localize warehousing, which is, you know, when you get to a growth level where you do localized distribution, it opens up a whole new aspect to your business. When I went there, and I've been there three times, we did tribe events and they all came and activated. You know, I'm on the morning news there a lot when we do things and, and they'll all be in the audience. I mean, they infiltrate through everything and they're coming in. And, you know, it's they're the most amazing, outspoken, fantastic women. And it's it's a privilege we have these women. And also they're really like your staunchest champions and they're your harshest critics. So when we do something and they might think, oh, we don't like that, we really think, okay, this is the feedback from the community. So what does that mean for us for product development? We really listen to what they're saying. That was a cut down version of how to be a CEO. To hear the full interview, click the link in our show notes. The Leader Podcast will be back on Monday afternoon at four o'clock.